Uh, my name is Eva Nanopoulos. I'm one of the four uh, co-directors of the Center of Law and Society um, in a global context. Um, this event is organized as part of the Center's um, Capital and Power Stream, which is led by uh, myself and, and Tanzil Chuduri, which is just here. He can wave at you so that you see who he is. He'll speak in a second. And uh, we are really very delighted to be launching today uh, a new series on law and Marxism uh, with a discussion of Tari Koch's book, uh, Global Justice. Uh, yes, he just uh, waved. Um, Global Justice and Social Conflict, the Foundations of Liberal Order and International Law. Um, now, uh, before I introduce our speakers today and, and uh, the discussions, um, Tanzil and I really wanted to say, you know, a few inaugural words maybe about uh, the series itself. I don't know how you feel, but I found that in these times of pandemics, it's kind of nice to make a point sometimes to sort of mark some special events so that it helps, you know, break the otherwise uh, slightly perhaps repetitive routine uh, of the lockdown. Um, so I hope, Tarek, you won't mind taking uh, us taking a few minutes of your time just to introduce the series. Um, Tanzil, do you want to just start with saying a few things about why we decided to do this? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So um, first of all, thank you to um, our uh, panelists, discussants for, for joining us for this uh, inaugural launch. Um, thank you to, to my friend and co-organiser, Eva, for um, uh, helping, uh, uh, putting this together with us. And, and, and we hope that this is the, the start of something really uh, rich and nourishing um, intellectually and, and, and politically. Um, so the Law and Marxism series responds to um, a resurgent uh, interest around the intersections of, of, of law, uh, legal studies and, and, and Marxist social theory. And I think this is partly kind of uh, exemplified by a lot of the big uh, compendiums of work coming out at the minute. So there's the 30 chapter forthcoming handbook on law and Marxism that's coming out uh, next year, I think, um, of which um, Eva has a, a, a brilliant chapter um, in. There's also the handbook of Marxism and post-Marxism, which came out in December of last year. I think the fantastic work that um, you know legal form blog are doing in terms of compiling canonical literature in this field and also inviting uh, scholars to offer really fantastic reflections on on the current conjunction. I, I actually did a, a very very quick and probably unscientific um, n-gram research, uh, n-gram search on, on on Marx and Marxist related terms, um, and and you can see that there's there's quite an interesting uh, increase from around uh, 2001 um, onwards. So Nate Holdren and Eric Tucker's latest paper provides a timely genealogy of Marxist theories of law, past and present, to use the term um, of, uh, to use the title of the paper. And it moves through the kind of um, Pashukanite commodity theories of law, the early economist theories of law and social relations, the Gramscian Laura's ideology literature, the 70s clash with critical legal studies, including Laura's constitutive of social relations, as well as the increasing discussions around Marxist state theory uh, and finally critical theory interventions, which were perhaps recently articulated in a fantastic uh, book, um, which was a conversation between Rahel Jaggi and Nancy Frazier. On top of this, you have stuff like the Pillag series, uh, growing visibility around um, issues and writings around racial capitalism, primarily from, prim primarily from a black Marxist lens, uh, discussions around constitutionalism and socialism, uh, the, the, the great work of the Law and Political Economy Network, though not strictly from a Marxist bent, speaks to a wider recognition of law's contingency and its interrelation with Marxist society, at market societies, rather. But this is also an important political moment, not just, um, well, I, I mean, part, part of the reason why it is an important uh, a political moment is that, you know, we, we understand now our current conjuncture with recourse to, to the, the social relations. So how do we organise people and the means of production? Uh, what does law do in that? How is it implicated? And is, is law possible to, to transform those uh, relations? So that's a little bit as to why we're doing what we're doing. I'm going to hand it back over to Eva, who'll talk a little bit about 
uh, our objectives and then introduce our fantastic speakers. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Tanz. And our objectives, I mean, yeah, what we're trying to do with the series, you know, it's, it's still work in progress, very much so. Um, and we're thinking really about what kind of interventions might be useful. And it, we, we are really very open to hearing from colleagues, students, etc., cetera, about uh, what sort of thing they might, they might have in mind. There's a few, however, ideas that are is guiding our thinking uh, at present. The first is, I think, we try and reach out beyond the established academic networks and beyond the Anglo-Saxon, uh, Anglo-American university, basically, and um, to have a sort of seminar series focused on perhaps smaller workshops with pre-circulated paper, where uh, those that have less access to established academic networks, uh, scholars from the global south, young scholars, um, writers that are not within the academy, you know, have the opportunity to really, and for us, to engage with their work. The second, maybe, idea is also that, you know, it's impossible to do Marxist legal theory we, without doing other disciplines, you know, political economy, social theory, etc. And, and I think all of our book discussions, this, this term, reflect that because we've always tried to combine one lawyer as a discussion with also someone that comes from a non-legal background, so to speak. Um, how we might foster that um, while building these interdisciplinary bridges is one, but we were also thinking about something more educative, you know, um, that we could draw in students and, and see because, let's face it, also the the legal education is not necessarily the best place where they can get a flavor of, of social theory, of Marxist theory. So maybe there is, there is a need for that beyond the kind of curriculum. And last as well, but not least, is to link up a little bit with um, another of the center's theme that is led by Isabel Royler, which is Art and Aesthetics. And we would envisage also that some events, you know, don't stick to the written word, but have kind of artists, uh, poets, etc., that have talked and speak to the intersection between law and Marxism in ways that might open up new ways for us as lawyers to really be thinking about those questions. So that's a bit what we have in mind, but as you can tell, you know, uh, we began basically with a series of three books that really are exemplary of, of what Tanzil was describing, of this new emerging, very exciting work. And, and we have more also coming, I'll say a few words in a second. But first, I, I want to really uh, introduce, but also really welcome uh, our three speakers. First, the author of the book we'll be discussing uh, on global justice and social conflict, um, Tari Kochi, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex. Um, this book was published in 2019, but it's not his first. Uh, the other was published in 2009 um, and is entitled The Other's War, Recognition and the Violence of Ethics. Um, much like the book we'll be discussing today, and this is really why I'm not going to attempt even to offer a summary myself, but his disciplinary range and the breadth of his interest is just... Um, Impressive. <laughs> he combines critical legal theory, political theory, historical sociology, etc. And he he writes on, you know, global justice, but violence, war, human rights, um, always with a critical um, commitment. And we're really delighted uh, that he has agreed to, to sort of introduce his book here in this forum uh, and to open up this, you know, launch the series effectively. Um, and uh, with us really to discuss this book, two equally amazing scholars. Uh, first, uh, Christine Schwobel Patel, who is an uh, associate professor in law at the University of Warwick, equally versatile and equally always committed to a critical agenda, critical approach to law. Um, she also works across a number of areas, international law, but also global constitutionalism, global governance, and crucially, I think, critical pedagogy. Um, 
Her first monograph appeared in 2011, Global Constitutionalism in International Legal Perspective. Uh, but uh, we are really eagerly awaiting, Christine, your, your second monograph, who is a bit delayed in production, I think, but soon to appear, uh, Marketing Global Justice, the Political Economy of International Criminal uh, Law with, with CUP, and we, we hope to host her too. So, um, so keep, keep, keep following us to, to hear more about that. Uh, and last, but really not least, uh, Joy Bloom, who is a PhD in international relations at uh, the London School of Economics, um, and also working on international criminal law in a way, but, but a fascinating project on the racialized ways in which international criminal law um, has historically, but keeps on construing the concept of humanity, uh, so away from kind of these, these kind of universalist approaches uh, and aspirations to humanity towards pointing to its colonial and, and racial legacies. So a very exciting panel, and uh, I'll stop here and hand over to the speakers. Each speaker will, will, will speak by between um, 10 and 20 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A. If you can all make sure you're constantly muted, that would be terrific. And the way I want to run the Q&A, hopefully, is um, if you can raise your hand, okay, the usual way, I have the participants there, I'll call you in to raise a question. Um, if for some reason you're unable to speak, please include the question in the chat, and I hope to be able to pick them all up. Um, yeah, so without further ado, Tarek, uh, up to you now. Yes, um, thanks, thanks, Eva, and thanks, Tanzel, for the, for the invitation. Um, the, the series you're putting together sounds um, absolutely fantastic, so it's, it's really really thankful to be here. It's, it's really quite an exciting series. Um, and thanks, thanks to Christine and Joe for taking the time to read the book um, and, and, and to comment and to engage with it, um, especially given the amount of pressures that people are under it at the moment. You know, taking the time to read someone's book is a, is a really, it's a really special thing, right? Um, especially in a world where we, we, we read things just read things quickly or read articles or read tweets, you know, chewing through a book um, is, is not something we do that often, right, anymore. Yeah? Um, so, you know, this is a great series in the sense that also your focus are on books and engagements with books, and that's, that's great. Yeah? Um, okay, let me start then. All right. Um, so, oh, do I stop watching? So this book... Um, which is what this one here, right? Um, tells two interconnected stories. So one is about the tradition of natural law and natural rights. Um, and the second is about a tradition of Republican constitutionalism. And the aim of telling these particular stories or giving, you know, theoretical reconstructions of them is to often offer an account of the key elements of the conceptual foundations of Western legal and political theory, which has shaped and continued to shape um, the current global liberal order and liberal international law. And part of what I'm doing is a, is a response to a dominant ideology and mythology of globalized neoliberalism, which wants to collapse our understanding of legal and political relations and collapse it into a kind of bastardized version of John Locke and, and Adam Smith. Right? And part of what I'm also doing is, is responding to an orthodox Marxist account of law and international law, say as that founded Gany Pashikanis, which also tends to collapse all legal relations into an economically driven commodification and the operation of um, 17th century ideas of bourgeois law as given by Grotius and Locke. So methodologically, 
what I'm doing when I'm, I'm broadly working with a Hegelian Marxist tradition, drawing upon disparate ideas developed by Ernst Bloch, by Antonio Gramsci, and by Nikos Palantzis. And so this type of account asserts the, cent the centrality of struggle. Yeah, well, the cent cent centrality of struggles, which are class struggles, which are normative struggles against any idea of economic determinism and against a, a base superstructure topology. Right? And in this, law is not determined by economic relations, but differing forms of law and political action play a co-constitutive role in shaping capitalist relations and, caping, and shaping um, capitalist social reproduction. Okay. So the story I tell then, back to these two bits, natural law and then natural law, natural rights and re the Republican constitution. The story I tell tries to hold on to the radicality of the tradition of natural law and natural rights. And remembering how in early Stoic philosophy, um, the story of natural law that is given by Zeno, and Sit Zeno of Citium in the third century BCE, natural law was an argument for a radical communist or heavily communitarian idea of a republic. Right? But the story of natural law that we have and the story of natural law that um, helps to structure Western legal and political thought is also a story of how this radicalism is constantly jettisoned in favor of an idea of natural law which justifies private property, skates over the original violence of private property, and is stuck within a constant tension between a kind of broad moral ethic of um, human fellowship and a theory of, social, theory of the social utility of egoistic private property relations. Um, so it's, it's this tension which I emphasize then in the reading of, of the rereading of, of natural law. So the, the, the way in which the radicality of natural law is, is jettisoned or put out, right, as a, as a form of political struggle. Um, and then this tension which takes up the story of property relations across the natural law tradition. Um, and which feeds into the way in which we think about, you know, property rights, uh, contemporary forms of global justice today. Yeah. Um, and so why is this important, this kind of older starting point within the Western tradition, um, or what we end up calling the West, or what we re-narrate as the Western tradition, right? It's, it's important to show that how, how a foundational structure, or foundational set of concepts around property has a longer and more nuanced history, um, a longer, more nuanced history than that, say, given by uh, in the accounts, the different, but very good accounts, but different accounts given by Koskinyemi or Anthony Anghi or by China Mayaville. Right? So I'm, I'm giving a slightly different account, probably a, a longer historical account of this, this intellectual history. Right? Um, and so key in this account, key in the story of natural law that I'm trying to tell then is a kind of tension around the property story which um, Aristotle, Aristotle describes in his politics. Yeah. So in one sense, he offers a, um, a defense of private property against forms of overt communal property against forms of communism, you know, such as described in different ways by Plato in the Republic or the Laws. And Aristotle argues that it's better if all men, and of course he's talking about men, he's talking about the household, the gendered household unit, right? He argues that it's better if all men look after their own interest, if they look after their private property. Yeah. Um, but he also argues then that, that this generates some form of social utility, yeah? that this operation of private interest or looking after oneself has a broader um, social function, a kind of a utilitarian social function. Right? Um, but he also then, within this defense, in this account of, this sort of proto-account of utility, 
makes an argument that there should be some sort of moral regulation, some sort of moral limit to the way in which we think about property and wealth accumulation. Um, and so he argues that the excessive wealth accumulation is, is, is corrupting, it leads to social conflict, um, and that we should have some account of virtue to regulate the operation of, of, of property relations and wealth getting, right? Um, so a kind of restrained form of property ownership, which is central to the virtuous life and his idea of human flourishing. And so then this is, this is a key tension that I argue runs through the whole of the natural law and the natural rights tradition. So an argument against radical redistribution, against communism, um, defended in the name of an unsocial sociability of self-interest. Yeah? Um, and yet property accumulation should not be complete under these accounts, should not be completely unconstrained. It should be constrained by some degree or some moral account of human social fellowship. So there's a tension there. Yeah. Um, and beneath this account, say in Aristotle, is of course a story of social and class conflict. Right? Um, there, the, there is a what, what we get as an apolitical theory is a fundamental, fundamental, uh, fundamentally political theory against radical democracy, against radical egalitarianism, yeah? within a context of overarching um, class and social conflicts within the Athenian Republic. Um, and so Aristotle presents then an aristocratic defense of private property as virtue. Yeah? And so I argue then that we can re, or what I try to do is kind of reinterpret or reread or, or re-gloss, if you want, um, the, the natural law and natural rights tradition as it develops in you know, parts of early modern thought in Europe and then spreads into the North Atlantic um, and then starts to become the conceptual structure of liberal internationalism, liberal international law, and then the basis of the way in which uh, many of the ideas of, of, um, of the contemporary liberal order is, is structured. Right? Um, and so I make arguments then that this tension between a, a social ethic, the egoistic, I mean, the tension between um, the kind of egoistic social utilitarian side um, and this social ethic of, of control of property or restraint of property relations spins off in a variety of different directions. You know? um, for someone like Cicero, who's profoundly important for the tradition of natural law and natural rights and, and modern legal thought. It's a really um, narrowed down argument in terms of the, the strength of moral restraint of, of private property relations, yeah? And a radical defense of property against um, any efforts to uh, uh, redistribute or, 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 or reinvent or even, even you know, limit private property relations, right? Um, for someone like, for and this this Ciceronian, Ciceronian account is in, in, you know, becomes heavily influential for um, 17th century thinkers like Hugo Grotius, and Grotius tries to deal with this tension between the the egoistic social utility by you know drawing on ideas of, of charity, on, on moral restraint, on moral restraint in relation to forms of imperialism, but uh, by uh, creating a kind of theoretical argument that property should be based on consensual relations. But like much of the tradition, he continually skirts around the question of the violent origins of property relations and the ongoing violent property relations. Yeah. So his account sort of falls into, in many ways, a kind of uh, an apolo apologetic account of of imperialism, and he can't hold the tension together. And I make similar arguments in relation to Kant as well, right? Um, and then on the reading of figures like Locke and Adam Smith become incredibly important because um, Locke and Smith really emphasize the, the, the idea of the social utility of private interest. You know, that becomes the core of thinking about the justification of, 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 a, of a logic of capital accumulation across the 17th and 18th centuries. You know? um, but, if, but they still 
there's there's still a kind of moral story which they're telling to justify this operation, you know? whether it's about um, charity or consent, or whether it's a story which Smith tells about um, utility operate in terms of the story of the greater good, historical progress, and a rise of living standards across the population. None of these thinkers can hold on to this tension, right? And for Smith, it turns, it ends up, it ends up with Smith sort of justif justifying, uh, you know, violent British nationalism and mercantilism against against the competing republic. You know? um, and so the key question in all of these accounts is, you know, how far does this story of the supposed moral constraint of property run before that idea of moral constraint systematically threatens the core operation of property or capital accumulation. And so as, as soon as moral argument pushes a certain limit and starts to threaten that, these thinkers draw back or fall back on a blindness in terms of the violence in relation to property relations. And so I argue then that, that this kind of tension and these limits run through um, large parts of the um, the liberal tr tradition of the 20th century, they're there in parts of contemporary neoliberalism, and they're also there in the kind of the social democratic global justice discourse, of which is the kind of neo-Rawlsian stuff given by Amartya Sen or Thomas Pogger or Martha Nussbaum. Yeah? They're all trapped, they're all playing out this, this kind of story, these sets of tensions. Yeah? And so then sitting alongside um, this story of of natural law and natural rights is a is another sort of intertwined story I tell within the book, which is um, an idea of, of of what I sort of loosely call um, or you know, um, constitutional constitutional antagonism. You know? And so again, what I do in the book is is I, I position the tradition of liberal constitutionalism, the neoliberal operation of contemporary constitutionalism and its transnational iteration as a kind of discourse and practice of global constitutionalism as something that inherits and constitu constitutes itself constantly against the radical tradition of Republican egalitarian democratic constitutionalism. And so, um, you know, and so in this discourse and sort of in terms of global constitutionalism, the kind of, you know, the, the, the thinkers that I'm critiquing in this respect, uh, you know, figures like Anne-Marie Slaughter or Gunther Teubner or um, uh, Matthias Kuhn, heavily involved in the journal Global Constitutionalism. Um, and so part of the argument I make is then that, that this discourse of liberal constitutionalism and fundamental rights at the national and at the transnational levels are set against an idea of antagonistic constitutionalism, which sees at the heart of legal and political relations, open struggles and contestations over property relations, over what counts as equality, over what counts as dignity, over the constitution of social justice and over the shape and direction of social reproduction. So the reading I, I, I develop goes back to um, a story of thinking about um, Republican constitutionalism and the democratic polity, which goes back to thinking about how um, Aristotle offers a far more materialist reading of constitutional relations. One which, um, this is in the politics, right? One which openly thinks about the operation of class and social conflict as struggles over what counts as justice in a society, right? Um, and so I, I developed this in a way because it's, it conflicts with the dominant, it, it contrasts with the dominant readings of Aristotle that we have in um, Western legal and political thinking, which are kind of uh, Alastair McIntyre in relation to kind of um, uh, virtue ethics, or Hannah Arendt in terms of this kind of um, kind of liberal Republi Republican agonistic democratic thinking, right? And so, by by going back to Aristotle, I'm kind of making a Marxist argument 
but the Marxist argument is already there. In Aristotle's materialist constitutionalism, he's thinking about legal and political relations as forms of struggle over the content of what counts as justice. Aristotle then gives a different, arist slightly aristocratic account of what he thinks that is, right? Which I don't hold on to, but it's the materialism which is important. And so I trace then that materialism and that way of thinking about legal and political relations as struggle, thinking about legal and political relations as struggle through a tradition of republicanism, um, emphasizing, in a sense, particular readings of Machiavelli, so is that given by Gramsci or Antonio Negri, um, drawing Hegel back into this story, and, and then drawing Marx back into this story, and, and emphasizing then um, uh, Marx's writing in the Civil War in France on, on the Paris Commune, right? And so then all the post-Marxist stuff of, of reinventing the idea of Marxist democratic theory plugs then into this type of story, right? Um, and so the point of that is to, is to broaden, a, 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 to recapture an idea of thinking about a Western legal and political constitutional tradition which has these questions at its heart and has them openly, right? And watches then how forms of liberal constitutionalism from the 17th century, whether that's Locke or whether that's Madison, continues a story of pushing these questions out, coalescing with a highly naturalized idea of natural rights that is already focused on private property and social utility, is anti-democratic and is anti-egalitarian. You know? And so the critique then is how elements of international law and global constitutionalism pick up this liberal story of suppressing not simply alternative ways of reorganizing the, the policy or political communities, but suppresses that as a question, suppresses the idea that we should think about legal and political relations as ongoing and end, as, as multiple forms of struggle over social, over um, the question of justice, of what counts as justice, and over the direction and shape of social reproduction. Yeah? Um, and so I make the argument then that if there's, if you want to hold on to bits of the Western legal and political tradition, I'm ambivalent about how much you want to hold on to. I'm not saying, you know, just, you know I think we have to ex accept there are many limitations of this tradition and we never want to engage in some sort of fo false universalization or sort of, um, uh, ep epistemological imperialism. All I'm trying to do is saying we can recapture parts of these traditions which are more radical, which are more interesting, and also offer methods of thinking about legal and political relations against the liberal story and the neoliberal story, which is, you know, fed down our mouths constantly in, in, in law schools or in textbooks or by the BBC or, or wherever, right? All right, I'm done. Cheers. Thank you so much, Tarek, for this very sort of um, good introduction and overview of the key arguments of the book. Um, Christine, should I have, uh, hand over to you? Is that okay? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so thanks so much to Eva and Tanzor for the invitation. It's a huge honor to be part of this first event in the series and to speak along such brilliant scholars. Um, and I think there's lots of excitement about just the fact that you've set this series up and the conversations that may come out of it. And then thank you, of course, to Tariq for writing this book and allowing me to um, engage with it. So the book, as you will have gathered from what Tariq just said, covers an incredible amount of ground and it's aimed to lay out the theoretical and material underpinnings of the global, liberal and neoliberal order. So in it, um, he looks back to the Mediterranean, Anglo-European and now globalized intellectual traditions as he just set out of natural law, natural rights and then Republican constitutionalism. So that's just a casual 2,300 or something years of intellectual history, which he navigates incredibly skillfully. So it, it, it is an intellectual feast from Aristotle to Cicero to Grotius, Kant, Locke, Smith, uh, and many more. 
and it's really fantastic in its engagement with primary sources um, and is a huge um, scholarly achievement. So I'm just going to briefly um, summarise uh, the, the argument as I read it, um, uh, although you just heard this, of, of course, from Tariq, but uh, I'll do it just in a few sentences. So Tariq argues that natural law, natural rights and republican constitutionalism are not reducible to their liberal and neoliberal interpretations. They are rather intellectual expressions of normative ideological class and political struggles over how to organise questions of social and economic justice. So it exposes this tension that he spoke about between an ethic of human sociability and fellowship on the one hand and the utility of unsocial and self-interested private property and commercial relations on the other hand. So having mapped out over two millennia of thought, Tariq then returns to the Republican constitutional tradition to excavate a radical notion of global constitutionalism. One that he suggests is suppressed um, uh, in liberal cosmopolitan and neoliberal theories of global constitutionalism. And for that conceptualization, uh, conceptualization, he returns to Aristotle, Machiavelli, Hegel, and Marx, and others. So the most important uh, contribution, as I see it, and where I think this will really become a reference work, is its centering on private property and class conflict. So, um, and despite its ambitious timeline, the analysis is really effective in drawing out the lineages, but also how contradictions and tensions were decided in favor of private property and not then of human sociability and fellowship. So ultimately it argues this is culminated in a global neoliberal constitutional order, and it is this order that needs to be undone. So opinions on just how integrated this order is will differ. And I'm not quite sure whether I saw how integrated Tariq sees it. And I would be curious to hear um, Tariq's thoughts about this and the audience's thoughts on this point as well. Um, so I'm not sure whether you uh, saw the Boston Review piece with the, uh, for this audience anyway, clickbait title, um, How Law Made Neoliberalism. Um, yesterday, I think it was, by Jedidia uh, Britton, Purdy, David Grewal, Amy, uh, Amy Kopchinski, who are um, sort of the founding members of the Yale Law and Political Economy Project um, that uh, was mentioned earlier. And they speak of a 20th century synthesis. So that kind of made me think about what um, uh, Tariq is uh, uh, denoting as this neoliberal constitutional order. So the, for the purposes of discussing Tariq's book, it is interesting that they note that constitutional law turned away from concerns of economic power, structural inequality, and systemic problems of racial so subordination. So we could also, um, argue that perhaps this gives law a little bit too much power, holding it up to what Dina Zavala has in her new book referred to as an act of legal fetishism only a lawyer would be capable of. But I guess this is the exciting thing about a Marx and law series, of course, namely to discuss what law does in the global order. And regardless of just how much power we attribute to law, I'm sure we agree that we are dealing with what Tariq calls a global order of injustice. So for quite some time, critics have been exposing and discussing the deep and deepening inequalities in the world. Those working in the Marxist tradition have shown that these are inequalities to be understood through material realities, in particular through processes of capitalist expansion. This is deep implications for how we approach the global legal order. So at a basic level, and here again, I think we can agree with the LPE project, it means to see the political and economic realities as imposing constraints unequally or constraints for the many and opportunities for the few. So while Marxists have different views on questions of how far and in what ways law reproduces capitalist relations, again, we can agree that the repoliticization of economic relations lies at the heart of much of this work, as it does in Tarek's book, too. 
So I read this book as very much in conversation with other recent law texts that have focused on historical materialism, and some of them will be part of this series too. So including Mike Park, Richard Bart, and Rose Parfit, and um, Dina Zavala, who's, who I've already uh, mentioned. Perhaps um, though Tarek's book is most closely aligned with Susan Marx's recent book, A False Tree of Liberty, which also traces ideas back in history, in her case, the late 18th century, when the rights of man arrived in English politics and culture in the sense of entering the stream of public discourse. She also engages with a history of an idea and its relationship to change in the material conditions of life. So as not many uh, women feature necessarily in the book um i thought from here on uh, i would place Tariq in conversation with some of the women who have engaged in this debate so to set up this fictitious conversation then in in no particular order and very the very brief points uh first then the question of centering liberal internationalism um when perhaps this is no longer appears to be the predominant vehicle for capitalist accumulation Second, the question of which historical juncture to focus on, uh, which sites of struggle to focus on, and from a Marxist perspective that takes class seriously, how to accommodate for voices, ideas, and ways of being that foreground gender and race, and perhaps therewith displace the Western intellectual tradition. Okay, so on uh, liberal internationalism, or the global liberal order. So I dare say that for international lawyers like myself, trained in the 1990s and early 2000s, there is a certain comfort in fighting liberal internationalism. Its declarations of freedom and rights in the service of capital, enforced by the suppression of protests, the dropping of bombs and crippling structural adjustment programs in much of the global south, was the first site of critique for those um, similarly minded to argue that international law is part of the problem. The establishment of the WTO in the late 90s and uh, the Iraq War of 2003 spurred perhaps the quintessential examples of this critique. But events have taken a different turn. Um, the rise of far-right populism slash fascism, Brexit-style barriers to trade, the rise of China and Russia, and finally COVID nationalism have destabilized some of the assumptions that liberal internationalism is our main point of reference for analysis and struggle. Not to mention that after acknowledgements of torture, Libya's devastation, a problematizing of the carceral straight state in public debate, not least through uh, Black Lives Matter, far fewer people really buy the liberal international narrative. Arguably, that is why it was, has gone from a serious standpoint to a rather ridiculous guise through pairing up with marketing liberal internationalism with bells and whistles. But that's a different story. So capitalism has clearly survived, but as it has departed further from its former liberal partner, it has survived in a different guise. One of its guises um, is frontier capitalism, for example, where the struggle between capital and labor has reached new and devastating lows. So we might think here of PPE contracts handed out that monopolize capital control over means to assist in a public health emergency, or of course, uh, the struggle over vaccine patents. So uh, th this is raising the question, what are, what are we fighting against? And is it really a global liberal order? Then the second point is on the historical jun juncture. So, um, and of course, uh, Tariq begins um, in Mediterranean antiquity and kind of returns to that too. So, oh my God, it's just massive roadworks outside the house, so shaking. Anyway, uh, a question we often ask ourselves is where in history do we begin and end with our critical analysis? And Tariq's focus is slightly out of tune with other critical uh, international lawyers, but lawyers generally are preoccupied with similar questions in that he does not dwell on imperialism in the book, or more specifically the period between roughly the 16th and 19th century, although of course he does focus on ancient practices of con conquest, etc. 
Again, we can argue here about where or when to focus our analysis, but we learn from Marx about, um, uh, about primitive accumulation, and this is, of course, also in Tarek's book, and even more so from Rosa Luxemburg and her analysis of primitive accumulation and imperialism, that co colonialism had profoundly transformative effects. And this is also in Dina's book both in the imperial metropole and its labor force and in the periphery, i.e. the spaces and places in the global south that were subjugated and exploited. In short, something significant changed in the material conditions of life during this period that is of great importance to thinking globally. So for international lawyers, the 19th century is, a, is, is particularly interesting as we can pinpoint the beginning of international law as a profession then. Um, often this was European lawyers who were concerned with the law in the colonies and the switch from the lawyers of the colonies to the universalized idea of international lawyers is of course telling. At the same time, this was a period in which the slave trade was made illegal, illegal and we know, of course, that this illegality meant a continued racialization of former slaves and a disregard of their agency. So this is why international lawyers focusing on third world approaches to international law or trail, including Dina and Rose, um, uh, center the 19th century. So focusing on property as Tariq does is incredibly important, but understanding the points in history in which property relations stratified seems to be just as important or perhaps even more so. So my last point then, what sites of struggle do we focus on? Why focus on global constitutionalism? So, uh, and this is perhaps my biggest question, um, why return to Aristotle and Kant for a progressive account of tackling global injustice? If we trace ideas through their material conditions, um, as Marxists do, is it, and this is a, this is a genuine question, is it a strange move to return and make these contingent again? Is it arguing against the false contingency argument put forward so clearly by Susan Marx? Does it matter that you say that the global constitutionalism, uh, that global constitutionalism could also be a site of struggle through ideas that were not really a site of struggle for a political movement as set forward by Tariq, but of individual men right so the struggle is there but the struggle is between one man <laughs> and his ideas so um if it's really important of course to acknowledge that there is an emerging interesting debate on radical global constitutionalism from the global south including video kamar's um thoughts on constitutionalism of the wretched where she draws on france fanon's uh, radical work uh, and she says the production of global constitutional theory by global constitutionalists involves the active non-production of the global South as an object or as a subject of the global legal order. So this raises the question of how to deal with this silence. Uh, but having engaged with this debate, I should also say for well over a decade myself, I see less and less why global constitutionalism should be a site of struggle. So there is an argument there with reference to Haiti, and I think it's an important argument to say that constitution, constitutionalism has had some radical potential, but it seems to me that the constitutionalist moment viewed from the perspective of revolutionary struggle has always been the reformist moment. So the argument of Robic, uh, re, uh, Republican constitutionalism Tariq did not persuade me um, com completely, um, also because although you deal with cl class struggle really well, it just seems to me while reading the book that going back to Aristotle and all those other white dudes is just not going to do much for women or racialized groups. So I kind of worried about the reproduction of ideas that might again appear um, racially neutral um, or, or neutral from a gendered perspective. So should this then include a, a move away from Eurocentricism um, and indigenous scholars, scholars from the global south, post-colonial feminist scholars and others have asked whether it is time to forget or to provincialize Europe. We need to be wary of ways in which we might be reproducing epistemological coloniality and, and um, Atari, what you, you said um, uh, just now um, demonstrates, of course, that you are aware of that. So does the reimagining or re-engagement with Eurocentric concepts reify ambitions of universality? 
Of course not necessarily, but in which ways do we then move on if we engage with struggle? Must this not include decolonial ind indigenous thinking? Here then we might invoke Marx and his, uh, and his famous words that philosophers have sought to understand the world. The point though is to change it. Changing it means to actively then or potentially looks to actively look outside of the um, Western centric ep epistemologies to understand other ways of being, knowing and living. Should we be actively seeking out the thoughts of those from or engaged with the global South to highlight and elevate them? And yet, and to close, as Susan Marx writes in her introduction to international law on the left, for all its important departures, Marxism remains connected to the ideas ag against which it developed. Marx's own reference points come, uh, came mainly from classical German philosophy, especially Hegel and his followers and classical economists, so Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Malthus and others. Uh, and with global justice and social conflict, Tariq has most skillfully demonstrated this connection, the connection to the ideas against which it developed for the discipline of international law and beyond, and that is um, a huge contribution. So thanks. Thank you so much, Christine, for, for, for all these this, um, important questions you raised also about the book. Um, Joy, you want to close, yes, this conversation? Thank you. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I'm just going to check the time. There we go. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that's a little bit of an act to follow. Uh, but uh, first of all, thank you to the centre. Um, and I think I've been thinking a bit <clears throat> as I've been reading this book in preparation for this series and uh, thinking a bit about Marx and praxis um, and how central, I, you know, this book, there's, there's something, there's a, a fascinating part of the book uh, where Tarek speaks about how even after, you know, the, the invasion of Iraq, where politically the kind of salience of, of liberal humanitarianism or liberalism as an international ordering principle lost its traction, it sort of maintained so much of its currency as, as a means. And so we tinkered around it and made liberalism more palatable, gentle, uh, restrained. Um, and I think, I think of thinking of the book in, in relation to the series and the space, um, what I think is really powerful about the book is many things, but one of which is a critique of this idea that there, you know, that, that some of the kind of softer or more radical elements of, of totalizing liberal international thought can offer salvation from the violences that they uh, constitute and that they are constituted by. Um, and I was thinking in preparation for this about, um, there's a, a line from, from Kennedy from where, I, where he says, you know, the law school is one of the most conservative sites. And I was thinking about this in relation to the, the central contention of the book of the site of struggle. Um, and like Christine, thinking of that in terms of kind of racial capitalist logics as well. Um, and how some of the debates around critical legal studies and critical race theory departed a lot around the space of the law school as a site of struggle and, and the kind of change that Christine is talking to. So by way of appreciation for both the book and Ava and Tanzel's work on this, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be, be here speaking about this book as part of a series which seems to bring us back into the kind of praxis and radical conversation that might engender that logic of freedom. Um, one of the things I think is really, really, I was really taken by about the book um, is the link between property, violence, law, and struggle. Um, and coming from an international criminal law background, uh, very often the idea of violence is so abstracted from the idea of property and dispossession. And what the book, I think, does really well is is allow us to see in, in and perhaps it's because I read it from an international criminal law perspective and it's written through different literatures. It's it's really fascinating and powerful in a time when there's sort of lip service given to colonial dispossession as some kind of crime that happened a while ago, but continuing processes of dispossession and capital accumulation 
uh, are written out of a story of what constitutes what the ICC says is the gravest harm to humankind. Sorry, lawyers, if I got that wrong. But uh, And so I think it's really powerful in drawing logics of property, capital accumulation and dispossession into the same analytic frame. Uh, and there's a particular part when uh, the book moves to discussing Kant where the dealing with just war theory about how just war is an extension of a, of a Kantian logic of uh, monopoly and violence and, and state coercion, uh, which I think really powerfully brings these into the same analytic frame. And I think that contributes both to Marxist analyses of the law that brings the violence more more directly into focus and kind of international criminal law focuses on on violence which abstract it from property and capital relations and I think that's a really powerful powerful contribution uh, and it's given me a lot to think about um, what I want to focus on coming from that is this there's the, the, the description of the project, you know, I think there's, it goes back to roots and the, the idea that we need to understand the roots of these egregious, uh, intellectual traditions, uh, and understand and, and pass out some of their more radical elements. But I think what's really powerful is this idea that kind of, I don't know if this is a method or a modality of, of thinking about law. So you say through the prism of thinking about law as a field of contestation and struggle. And I'm thinking a lot about prisms and fields. Um, and I think um, I've been thinking about a field and what the field is. Uh, and I, I think a bit spatially in my own work. And and I I want to, in the rest of my talk, sort of move through some of the 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 startling revelations in the book through thinking about different meanings of what field might be to kind of think through where the sites of struggle might be and how that relates to their compelling contributions on property and violence. Um, so I think on the one hand, we think of a field as a discipline. Um, and I think what is really fascinating about this book is that it transcends disciplines. It's, it's an international relations text that is clearly uh, deeply entrenched in legal tradition, uh, legal thinking, legal argument. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And, and again, here, um, from an international criminal law perspective, you know, this, this bringing property into criminality and bringing dispossession into a realm of extensive gravity uh, is really interesting to me. Um, I think there's another way of thinking about field within the discipline, uh, and that relates to a relationship between colony and metropole. Um, and whether that is a physical colony and metropole geographic spaces or the kind of epistemic colony and metropole relations that happen under settler colonial and broadly colonial co um, entrenched global orders. So I think, you know, we think of field and the field work. Uh, the notion of field work, right? Field, the, the real thinking happens in the university. Field work is somewhere outside in, in, and, and, um, we think of um, within practice, and this then I sort of want to draw this back into the relationship between the discipline and the practice. In, in ICC talk, there's a field office uh, that happens outside of where the main work happens in, in The Hague. Um, and I think it's really powerful here how um, thinking through the prism of the field invites us to think of both geographic and intellectual space and the relationships between space and place and the egregious effects of neoliberal capitalism. Um, so I want to stop briefly there and talk about Grotius, and I think it's really interesting how there's this focus on the freedom of the sea and how You've shown how the trade relations have and, and relations to consent and property have, have shaped that in the evolution of legal thinking. Um, and again, coming back to what I'm really interested in, so what is so powerful here, this relationship between property and violence um, and the relationship between disciplinarity and practice as fields. Uh, I, I remember being at... Um, the Assembly of States Parties to the Rome Statute uh, a couple of years ago, 
And it was at the time when South Africa had withdrawn uh, from the Rome Statute or was threatening to withdraw. And, you know, there was all, I think, the kind of struggles that you talk about, these normative contestations about global justice, what is the international what is a rogue state um, were kind of the focus of, of NGO academic uh, civil society speak. Um, I'm going to read you because I thought about this with Grotius on the Sea. Uh, so South Africa's uh, Minister of, of Justice, Michael Masuta, um, so it was 2014 and, and he started with... Uh, in 2014, we recall the seminal events in world history, the outbreak of the world, Great First World War. Um, cynics, uh, sorry, also known as the Great War due to the unforeseen bloodshed inflicted by modern weapon systems, it also called with an unjustified degree of optimism the war to end all wars. However, cynics referred with an uncanny foresight to the peace concluded at Versailles in 1919 as the peace to end all peace. 20 years later, the world was at war again. South Africa was not spared the horrors of the First World War, the first time our troops fought outside borders outside our country. On the 21st of February 1917, the SS Mendy, transporting 823 personnel of the 5th Battalion of the South African Native Labour Corps from Southampton to Le Havre, sank in the English Channel after it was struck amidships by a freight freighter. 616 South Africans died in the cold waters of the English Channel. Oral history records that the men met their fate with great dignity. So I think there's something here in the kind of Grotius and the ocean and what that, what the field is, uh, in terms of place. And, and I, I think there's something really interesting that you open up here is in thinking, is space, in spatializing these intellectual traditions and perhaps drawing on what Christine said, this may be a way to think of outside the kind of ontological frameworks of Western, of the Western canon. Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me go here. Uh, and I want to draw this into conversation with your, your reflections on Kant and, and cosmopolitanism. Um, and again, I think what you, you show really powerfully is this kind of restraint on, on force and the, the idea of consent and how that has related to the evolution of property rights. Um, and again, I think thinking of the field here as a kind of geographic field, a spatial field, um, I've been reading a lot of, uh, of, of, of the kind of travel writing that informed Kant's theorizing of, of universal humanity and how notions of, of the human or who was human predicated on deeply unhumaning logics of particularly, uh, of, of people within Southern Africa and the Cape uh, shaped this idea of, of who is human and who is not and how, how that um, informed his theory so that there is always a space, uh, a space for that. Sorry, I'm just, oh, that's great. Thanks, Eva. Uh, a space for that. So I'm wondering there, um, again, thinking with Christine here, um, of how thinking of place and space within the notion of field might open up a way to think not just of, of the Western canon as having, uh, you know, as being something outside of the global South, but as something that it very much extracted from it um, and how we might then open up thinking for, around how, how capitalism itself is both an economic logic, um, but also the kind of metaphysical components and how capital accumulation has always been predicated on and, and produced in, in, in concert, as Sylvia Winter says, with the natural sciences of notions of who is human and who is not, and who is property and who is not. Um, and I think this comes, I suppose, let me, I know I'm running out of time, and Christine has also said many of the things. Um, I think the, I think that the point here that might be an interesting thing, and I'd be really interested and curious to hear what others think of, of, you know, what are your benchmark dates? I know I've come as this is me, my IR brain talking where you, you gotta have a benchmark, uh, and, and, uh, piece of Westphalia is one. Um, but I think 1492 is a really interesting point there. Um, and again, thinking with, with winter and this, 
this moment where, where capital accumulation and dispossession is linked very clearly to a notion of land and territory and knowledge production, or I mean, Ravi Shilliam talks about tilling and knowledge cultivation, which also for me evokes the field, um, how perhaps if we bring these if we bring these these thinkers in conversation with the spaces and places of their fields in various forms, uh, and we think from 1492 and and the kind of invention of man as white Christian bourgeois heterosexual man and the the racializing processes that went along with that, um, I wonder where that might take us. You know, thinking with I'm thinking also here with Rob Knox's work and Fanon and Stretch Marxism, um, and how these link to struggles between law, labor, capital, and power, and how these relate to logics of property violence and capital. And I, yeah, thank you so much. It was a really fascinating book. Thanks. Thank you so much, Joy. This was really great. Uh, thanks to all our speakers, really. Um, Tarek, I'm not sure whether you want to say a few words in response. Um, try to keep it a bit brief to draw as many people in. I had originally planned to try and end by half past, but I will, I will allow for at least 40 past to, 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 to let the discussion go in. And in the discussion, are you okay for me to take two or three questions at a time with the speakers? Yeah. Great. Can I just, I'll just, I'll just respond very briefly. Um, okay. um I guess uh, thanks to both of the, to, to Joe and Christine for a really interesting engagement. Thank you for taking the time. Um, just, to, just so maybe two points. Um, I guess my benchmark date, Joe. I'm, I'm thinking the first century before the Common Era, Cicero, Rome. Like, I, w what falls out of the story of of liberal thought, the globalization of liberal thought, is is how much we owe to how much that owes to Roman imperialism, right? And the way in which um, a, a Roman Republic portray, was managed to portray itself in this kind of, to itself, as this fan fantastic story of, 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 um, of, of citizenship, of material progress, of power, right? Um, and meanwhile, this is a horrible, gendered, brutal, slavery, imperialist exercise of, you know, run by assholes. You know? um, and, and so, you know, so much of the core ideas which we think about within modern liberalism go back to figures like Cicero. And I think having a holding on to those and thinking about how how these ideas, which were pre-capitalist ideas, play a role in helping to shape then the interaction between Europeans and the colonized in that colonial moment is important for thinking about the different types of constitutive roles that a whole host of ideas, European ideas, through this Roman tradition have played, right? It doesn't mean the constitution doesn't go back the other way, right? Because these are mutually const constitutive, right? Um, that's the moment I want to hold on to in part of the story. Yeah? Um, and Christine, thanks. Like, I'm, like my name's Tarek, right? I grew up in a Muslim family in a settler colony called Australia with Albanian grandparents. Um, I, the, the question of race is there. We know the question of race, yeah? We know of, about that there's, there's problems of going back to this sort of story which you know which is problematized and sort of black athena these these type you know we know the imperial legacy of this thought we know the importance of 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 not participating in that colonial legacy right um and so i hope i'm not doing that i'm i'm what i'm also doing is is asking we have to ask the question of how much of this European tradition of thought do we challenge? How much do we hold on to? How much, is how much even as much as we critique it and, and decolonize it, how much does it still structure our thought unconsciously, right? 
So we still speak in an imperial language of English when we have these conversations. We still use a language of critical theory, right? Um, we, we, we have to make choices about, about how, which parts of the tradition are relevant or helpful for us in thinking about social liberation or equality. Um, and so that's partly what I'm doing when I'm trying to hold on to bits and pieces of this tradition, right? Um, but, and, and to do that, I've had to close off questions about race and gender, right? Because obviously you can't tell a complete story of anything, of any of this story without engaging with questions of, of race and gender, right? So it's a, it's a highly reified account that I'm giving, yeah? Um, but I, I think um, to, to bring this back to the question of liberal internationalism, the question would be how much does liberal internationalism disappear, right? So we might say it's, it's on the defensive, yeah? um, but it's important, I think, to try and make the links between liberal internationalism, the different morphings into neoliberalism and the relationship between neoliberalism and populism like, like Brexit, which is a neoliberal project. Yeah. Um, wh whether, you know, whether, near, whether liberal internationalism will have the same force in 50 years, 100 years, who knows? But I think in, in terms of a, of, of a set of ideas which still play a large role in the constitution of global relations, it's still worth having a bit of a pot shot at it, right? Um, so yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take questions now, but yeah, cheers. But thank you both for you know really engaged, thoughtful comments and, and really valid criticisms, right? So, yeah. Terrific, Tarek, thank you. Um, and thank you for keeping it quite brief so that we get also a chance to hear, and I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions as well. So I'll, be, I'll open up now for questions. As a reminder, you can just raise your hand. Hopefully, you'll appear in the order in which you do so on my participants list. If you're unable to speak, please put your question in the chat. And I'll try to keep an eye. Um, No, any any questions? Well, other well, otherwise I can I can <laughs> I can I can start off. You know, this, this gives me it's, it's great. It's it's like not even me abusing my privilege or share. I just can chip in. Uh, I want to. I mean, push a little bit more. Just this this um, point that. Christine made, and that you came back to, obviously, it's a very fad account that you, you, know, you can't address all questions. But I had, because of the own, my own kind of work as well, the, the two questions. One of the things that you said, and I find really productive, is the idea of going back to, to Roman imperialism. Because I do think that... Um, in terms of, you know, the wider question is how do we do the colonial or, or new histories and theories, really? And going back to Roman imperialism, for me, it's not necessarily a conservative move for the reason maybe that, you know, as Christine was saying, like, most international lawyers would not regard that period as product of, of international law at all. It's like it's not even there, right? At best... I mean, it crystallizes as a profession much later, but also a lot of people wouldn't see that as international or properly so-called. So I think going back to that also, and perhaps what do you think about disturbing the very idea that there wasn't such a thing as law that then contributes to shaping not just contemporary ideas, but contemporary international law, how, how, how that might be important. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, to pick up on is the, uh, Christine's last point, you know, about materialist approaches, like that, how could we contribute to the colonial theories and histories? I take Christine's point, for example, that, um, you know, Marxist concepts to some extent were also worked out against sort of the liberal establishment, etc. So there is a way in which they might also have the onset of flaws or something we go back to, but 
I also tend to think that Marxism is far more than that. It's it's more of a method, really. And and is a is a value still in holding on to that, like not sort of because you do find a lot of criticism about Marxism being Euro, Marxism being Eurocentric, and I always found some of his claims a bit far stretched. So I wonder what what you made of that of, of those two two questions and how they fit into your book. Um, and because I have well, I have Rob Knox, so I, we we could take two or three questions. So my myself and maybe a couple of more. Rob. Hi. Um... Thanks for that, Tarek, and thanks, um, Joe and Christina as well, for, for great responses. Um, a lot to think about, and uh, some of the questions I would ask would be too long and involved, and no one needs to hear a long disquisition on interpretations of Pashikanis or whatever. But one thing I was interested in, in a sense, is the contrast that you just drew between ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and your recounting of ancient Greece. And I guess I was just interested in, like, what are your reflections on slavery in ancient Greece? And the role that, indeed, some of the Greek like philosophers that you're talking about, their thoughts on slavery were used in subsequent contexts to try and justify slavery. So I'm thinking of Aristotle and the natural slave and all this kind of thing. So the line you draw, seemingly between the kind of Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy, I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about how you figure the role of the slave and the figure of the slave in this Greek thought. And what consequences that has for these kind of like future Republicans things? Because, of course, in distinguishing yourself from Arendt, which I, you know, I, I liked and thought was very good. I still think you left, in a sense, that question um, unanswered, which is that in something like Aristotle's thought, even at its most radical, there was a vision of the polis underpinned by a group of people whose labor was just simply not even imagined as being labor in that kind of sense. And I wonder what that does to a story of republicanism in that figure. And of course, we could trace that, I think, very bluntly later on. But I was just interested in what you said in relation to Greece in that sense. Terrific. Thank you so much, Rob. There's uh, not exactly a question in, in the chat, Howard. Um, do you want to come in? I mean, perhaps, but... Yeah, uh, you're, you were talking to me? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, here, let me... Um, uh, yeah, uh, just on the point just made, uh, I think it's really critical. I, uh, uh, Richard Seifert has done work on uh, monetization in ancient Greece, and that's a critical feature here. In other words, the emergence of monetization creates um, uh, a, uh, uh, a whole narrative for Western society that um, flows very easily into colonialism and dispossession in the sense that um, we treat each other instrumentally and we, in the marketplace, we learn to treat each other instrumentally. And as a result of that, we treat our activity instrumentally, we treat our raw materials instrumentally, and we treat land instrumentally. So we get extractivism and so forth. So that's, that's an important um, uh, point. Um, which uh, it goes back to the underlying theoretical underpinnings, which you can't deal with without uh, uh, grappling with base superstructure. I think it, the, that's gotten a very bad rap in terms of the evolution of Marxism. And I think there, in general, for example, in terms of law and Marxism, the way we've dealt with base superstructure is, is in a really superficial way of uh, looking for a particular policy or interest that's driven by a superficial economic interest, rather than looking at the underlying fundamental structure of capitalism and parsing out what that structure is and then seeing how the autonomous realm of normative structures, for example, in other words, law is its own structure because it's fundamentally, it's about coercion, period. It's not about the appropriation of labor. It's about the appropriation of behavior. And so um, uh, you, you 
you have that autonomy of law, but the relations of coercion that are developed are there to reproduce underlying economic structures. Thank you so much. Tariq, do you want to just reply quickly to this three first set of comments? I mean, you don't need to prioritize mine, to be honest, but and we have already a couple of yeah. other questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, very briefly, thank you for the questions. Um, I guess uh, the, the question of Roman imperialism, uh, I think, is – is, is something we, we forget too quickly about within the liberal tradition. Um, and I, I think what I try to do in the book is show how Cicero's thought around the justification of private property, the anti-democratic defense of private property, um, and the kind of moral story he tells within that is, is key for the conceptual structure of modern international law in the way that Grotius is a rewriting of Cicero. Yeah. You can't, you know, and, and Adam Smith pays such emphasis upon Cicero as well in his lectures on jurisprudence, right? Um, and so, to, so they have different moral accounts of what to do with property in certain ways, right? But, you know, and if we think about the, you know, the Ciceroian arguments in terms of just war, like it's a stone's throw to the invasion of Iraq, right? This is this, this is this is a long world view. This is a long narrative of domination in which property plays a role. Yeah. Um, but I'd agree with you definitely in terms of Marx, and we we take from Marx a method in many ways, right? And 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 it's important to think about how different forms of thought around the world can be be taken as forms of method, right, and, and detach from their con context and from who wrote them, right? Recontextualize, of course, but sometimes we think of things as method, right? And that's what I'm trying to pull out of through parts of this book. Right? I don't care about these people or who wrote what, right? But there's some interesting ideas there in tracing a narrative of, of, of domination and also some interesting ideas in thinking about important methods for contemporary forms of struggle. Um, Rob, thanks. Like your points, are, it's a really important point. And what what I'm not trying to do is say Greece good, Rome bad, right? I think you know much of the account that I'm I'm, I'm I, the, the the account of Aristotle in there. I'm, I'm trying to draw out a certain method of Aristotle uses, which is materialist to think about constitutionalism, right? And I want to contrast that with his justification of private property, which for him meant slavery, right? And so in the way that someone like Moses Finlay, um, who, someone, who Perry Anderson uses quite a lot, right? Moses Finlay emphasizes that these are conquest states and that the operation of slavery is, it's, it's not just something in the background, it's the heart of their political economy, right? And so when, when Aristotle is talking about private property and the social utility of private property. He's talking about the social utility of using people who he doesn't think are people in that story. Right? Um, and that, that devaluing of human life and turning them into property, you know, we all know is, it keeps popping up in the development operation of capitalism. Right? So, so there's, so it, I, so I'm critical of that in the book. And I think whole rereading Aristotle in that way, is, is important, you know, not, not to hold him up as some amazing figure to celebrate, right, when there's as much blood on his hands as everyone else. Um, Howard, thanks. Like, um, base superstructure, I, I'm not going to get into a long argument about base superstructure. I take a position from Palancis, right, which um, we, who argues against an orthodox account of base superstructure, who wraps everything up into into a dynamics of political normative struggle, and, and you can't, you, he doesn't want an account of economism, right? You can't separate the economic realm from from the political, from the normative, right? So that that's the position I'm taking. Um, we probably will disagree, but that's that's where I'm coming from in that respect. Thanks so much. Um, I there's a couple of more uh, hands raised, so I would I would hope to 
they can be brief so that we can give an opportunity to Tarek and also the discussions to, to reply first. Uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce it, Sharzad. Yes, hello. No, that was, good. That was a good, so that was a good one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Shaz Afolavand. I'm a lecturer in international criminal law, actually, um, working with, um, uh, Tarek in the, in the law school. So, um, thank you very much for the organizers because this was a great opportunity for me who could, um, attend here to listen to Tarek, which I missed his, uh, his talk in our school. So, um, I feel much better about that. So, um, really enjoyed your book and really enjoyed the, uh, uh, the kind of reviews and comments from Christina and Joe on, on your book, Tarek. However, my, my kind of question goes back to Joe's, uh, kind of uh, comments that you, you made, uh, you made earlier. Perhaps I missed your, um, your, your, the point that you were referring to the International Criminal Court, the ICC, that uh, I personally worked there for a while, a few years back, and I missed where you were placing I guess your idea was around humanity uh, and you were put, you were trying to put that into the context of what, um, Tarek was, uh, uh, was uh, saying the international law, uh, generally. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. I would be very interested. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, we also have Maya Pal. Maya, do you want to come in with your question? I think we can hear you very well, or at least I can't. Oh, yeah, that's probably oh, yeah, better. Great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, thanks, Eva, and, and thanks, Tarek, and, and the centre. This is brilliant uh, to launch this today. Um, I, I'm a bit reluctant for my question. I'm not sure it's fully formed. So, Tarek, if you want to just ignore it, please do. Um, and uh, I, I just also want to congratulate you again for the book. And, and I, I'm barely seeing anybody, but somebody's already nicked my copy. So that's the sign of how good it is. <laughs> Um, but yeah, my question, it's made me, well, you, the way you summarized, uh, your point, and I think this is in the book as well, the way you put it is, uh, you want to think of international law as this multiple forms of struggle over justice and over shape, the shape of social reproduction. And so I've just been in my head, like thinking over, how we separate those two things, justice on one hand and social reproduction on the other. And I'm assuming you, you use social reproduction in the broader sense here, right? Not in the kind of more specific feminist, uh, Marxist feminist sense. And I'm just, I guess my curiosity about trying to think through your, you know, your really interesting ideas of radical constitutionalism and, and what we can retrieve, right, from this, um, uh, is how it, does it have scope to rethink materially the relationship between justice and social reproduction? Because it seems to me that what this tradition of liberalism has really done is made sure that that relationship is based uh, on private property as the state holder of determining the means for private property. And, 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 that, and that justice remains something that is uh, a privilege of those defended by the state and owning private property in, in various ways. And somebody mentioned Ronche capitalism as well. I think it was Christine. So, so I'm just, you know, can we really, with the elements of this radical constitutionalism, rethink that relationship? Or are we bound to, to be tied in, in the limits that are set up, I think, uh, in between those two elements? So, yeah, sorry if that's not yet formed enough. I'll continue thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. I'll take a last question uh, before I am um, giving the floor back to Tariq and also the other discussions from uh, Raghav. If you can come in, you raise your hand. Uh, yeah. Hello there. Hi. Uh, so uh, thank you to all the panelists for the uh, discussion. Uh, my question is, uh, I don't know whether it's a simple question or not, but uh, I have thought of it uh, very simply that uh, do Marxism or capitalism, either one of them, influence the uh, creation or the development of uh, just cogens? As in, uh, you know, the, the fundamental principles of international law, uh, you know, how do we say when did the first principles arise or when were they, when did the inception, uh, you know, happen? Uh, for example, you know, if if a particular treaty existed between two nations, which were heavily capitalist nations, uh, would we say that the origins of just cogent is capitalist? Or if, you know, there was a treaty between two nations which were heavily Marxist, 
would we say that the origin is you know marxist and like how how would we determine this question basically thank you so much tarik i leave you to respond and then i'll invite christina and joe also if they want to pick up on anything that was said yeah yeah thanks very really briefly um use cogens i'm not sure like i think maybe it's worth thinking about in terms of use cogens it's more you know the 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 damage is done more in the exception than in the rule right because the it's it's the lovely idea within sort of a liberal normative framework but you know have uh in if we think in terms of wider history of colonialism that they've just been ignored like by the western states who've you know put these forward um my no thanks it's a, it's a it's a good question um relationship between justice social reproduction and radical constitutionalism across international law like like i'm not i'm not really holding on to a, a, a firm, it's not a, it's not a well worked out account of of global constitutionalism as a side of struggle right it's a it's an end point in the book of of thinking if if there's any value in thinking about global constitutionalism I'm not sure there is I, I'm not exactly sure right but if there is any value in thinking about it then it has to it has to operate as a as a, as a site of struggles which displace normatively the account you gave right um whether whether that's possible in the next 100 or 200 years I don't know right and 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 whether these fora will still be there or whether these we or whether these fora are, are, are too interested in the defense of their own position for any any of that kind of radicalism to uh move into them is probably more likely right yeah so so the, the struggle is the political struggle of transnational capitalist class to keep these institutions for themselves and keep keep the rabble and the the ratbags out right so a continuation of that long anti-democratic tradition that's more likely i think right but 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 whether there's resources to think whether there's resources from the a global constitutional from a constitutionalist register that help thinking about this in other forms of struggle i think there's there's something there but i'm not going to hold on to it too strongly cheers Thank you so much. Um Christine first do you, is there something you want to pick up on and return to? No, I'm fine but I think there was a question directed to Joe wasn't there so. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Joe. Hi. Uh yeah, thanks Shaza. That thanks. It's a really interesting question. Uh and it's you know it's something that the book asked me to grapple with a lot. Um I think there's a couple of ways that that uh I would think about that. Um <clears throat> and I think perhaps since we both work on ICL and many of us do, you know, starting from from what ICL engenders both as modes of sort of how how harm and violence is construed through ICL and I think on the one hand um the mode of individualized criminal responsibility um and that coupled with the kind of the temporal uh, juris uh, limitations on temporal jurisdiction either not before 2002 or within a particular situation um means that both your i think for me your historical sort of structural conditions both within a particular context and kind of global violence and dispossession is written out of of how criminality is assigned so we focus on one individual you know what uh, Kamari Maxine Clark talks about you know the 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 creation of the 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 warlord uh, figure which obviates kind of the many colonial histories that produced uh race class ethnic divisions within particular context global power a sort of circulations of capital that continue to uh to to cause conflict that are quite written out when you focus just on the individual uh within a time frame um and i think the what is really interesting about linking property and violence here and i would go uh i have to sort of read this with with some of umar bar's recent work on on 
contestation and struggle is how these processes are themselves quite racializing, right, in, in assigning individual criminality along logics of criminal justice and policing logics that continue to reify um, kind of racialized logics of black people as non-citizens and non-subjects um, creates, I think, a logic that abstracts um, what is considered grave and harmful from a logic of uh, dispossession. And so I think what's really interesting about the book is it draws these into quite interesting conversations in ways that neither liberal nor some of the kind of responses of taking up of colonial histories of international criminal law have, have attended specifically to dispossession such that it's not just in the past, but is continuing and continually constitutive of both violence and race and gender, sexuality, amongst other identity markers and structures. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, well, on that note, because it's, we're approaching the end, really, we've already overrun a little bit, and uh, I'm sure that those that had other comments or, or questions uh, would be able to reach out to Tariq and, and raise that directly with him. Or, I mean, it's the beginning, not the end of our conversation about your book, Tariq, I believe. It's, it's a never-ending journey to try and engage people in these things. But I really wanted, again, to take a moment and thank all three of you for, uh, for, this, for accepting to, to present and speak to us and also the audience for being so engaged and, and making me and Tanzil, I think I speak for both of us, feel that, that reinvigorated and also that, that, that our decision to launch this series in the middle of otherwise a very busy term and, and you know, pandemic like conditions that, that there is appetite for these kinds of conversations and, and enthusiasm and there's many things still we have to think to. So thank you very much everyone.